unto salvation involves, presupposes, doing what he says must be done. And that's shown in, in many examples. Uh, the other classic case of misinterpretation that is easily refuted if a, and should be seen by a person if a person is looking at things honestly are the few passages that are cited about being justified apart from works of the law, okay? When that's clearly indicating, in context, the works of the old law. And so, for instance, in Romans 3.28, when it says that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, many Protestants, maybe yourself, interpret that to mean that men are justified by faith without any consideration of any human deed. And that is clearly ridiculous because in Romans 3.1, it introduces the topic of circumcision. And throughout the book of Romans, it's all about how the Gentiles cannot be excluded simply because they are outside the law of Moses. And so the context is without any question referring to how God can grant you salvation through the faith of Christ apart from any limitation to the works of the Old Testament system. And so it's just a gross misinterpretation when people quote those few passages and say, well, this you know, excludes any consideration of human deeds at all. And then there are a few other passages which people will cite, like Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. By grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And when you compare that passage to Titus 3.10, you can see the language is almost exactly the same in certain passages. And it's referring to the first grace of justification, the first justification, which is unmerited, okay? That you can put yourself in a position to receive it, but only the blood of Christ can actually take away your sins. It's almost like you can step into the batter's box, you can pick up the bat, you can put the gloves on, the helmet, etc., but only God can hit the ball. And so when it's emphasizing that point about how it's only God's power that can actually take away your sin through his sacrifice, people misunderstand that. And those are the three principal areas of misinterpretation. Meanwhile, people focus on those, Protestants, and they ignore hosts of passages which clearly indicate that man is not justified by faith alone. For instance, in sacred scripture, it says very clearly in James chapter 2 that you are justified by works and not by faith alone. Uh, the whole parables of Jesus, many of them make no sense whatsoever in a faith alone theology where he talks about in Matthew 5 how you must cut off your hand or pluck out your eye lest it you know, be an occasion for you to be doing things that will cast you into hell. Uh, in Matthew 7, he says, Not all who say, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who doeth the will of my Father. Um, in every single passage about judgment, it refers to being judged on the basis of your works. Every single one. In the one place in sacred scripture, in Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus is directly asked, Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? In response to that question, Jesus doesn't say, well, just believe, or you're mistaken. You don't have to do any good things to attain eternal life. No, he actually says, you must keep the commandments, Matthew 19:16 through 17. So it's clear. And then we have St. Paul. I, I have about, well, my, my opening statement, I'll just, finished by pointing out that St. Saint, Saint Paul clearly indicates that certain sins will exclude you from salvation, and he also indicates and he also indicates in 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 27, uh, he talks about how salvation involves a race, which we must run to the end. And he says that, I fear when I've preached to others that I myself should become a castaway. And actually, the word he uses there in the Greek is adokimos. It's the same word which is used in numerous other passages in the New Testament to indicate lost souls, mortal sins, mortal sinners, and apostates. So St. Paul himself clearly says that he could become a reprobate or an apostate, indicating that man can lose his salvation. So I, I've had, had my time for the opening statement. If you wanted to respond, you could... Um. No, no, we, um, we'll probably be just, uh, since we don't have, like, a moderator or anything, we'll probably be just kind of free-form going back okay. and forth. And like, so I'm, not, I'm not concerned about time. You know, I'll think of something, and I'll say, okay, well, what do you think about this? More okay, about sure. That's um, fine. 
I, I think that, uh, you know, and those all seem very compelling, as I said. This is, this is by far your best case. I mean, this is, a, this is and, you know, I, it really does appear to say that. I, I hesitate to believe it. I mean, I, I, I hold back from believing it because of what else you see in Scripture. The ant, uh, from the beginning of all the epistles and everything, and, and even in the Gospels, there's this antithetical thinking. There's us and them. It is constantly drawn, the line between us and them, and there really isn't any talk about... <coughs> uh, the, the saints are never described as sinners. The sinners and people of the world and those who dwell on the earth, like in Revelation, are never described as... Uh, I mean, they're never described in the same light. There's just this dividing line. Now, it says in many passages not to be partaken, to not partake in them of their deeds and all that, but... When Paul is facing his death, and when Peter is facing his, his death, and Stephen, of course, we don't see anybody concerned about uh, their souls. I mean, I guess they know, uh, you would say, of course, in, in the Catholic view, that they, they know they're going to be justified, they know they don't have any sins, or they've confessed, or whatever. But I just, there just doesn't seem to be that. I've Well, there, I actually, there are certain passages, if I may just respond to that. Like, yeah, like, well, like the one you just used with the, uh, the castaway? Well, not only that, but specifically you were mentioning the concept of fear. Well, like in Acts chapter 5, uh, after Peter struck Ananias and Sapphira dead by the power of God, and it says in Acts 5.11, And there came great fear upon the whole church and upon all these that heard these things. And uh, it goes on to say, I believe in that same chapter, that they continued walking in the service of the Lord and in the fear of the Lord. Okay, and so, and in St. Paul says in Philippians 2.12 or 2.13, depending on the Bible you have, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so this idea, that's, this is, I've, you know, Protestants bring this up. Well, what you're saying is opposed to the gracious comfort and the, that, you know, the gospel should afford us. Well, actually, no, that's just a selective uh, application of certain passages. There are clearly passages which indicate that you must fear for your salvation. And that's why a lot of these uh, letters are written to the believers and he's warning them, you know, you better not do certain things. And so he's clearly inculcating a certain fear. Obviously, within that context, there can be a hope and a comfort if a person is walking correctly. But the idea that it absolutely excludes any concern or fear would not be correct. I've, I've had, uh, I've had uh, other uh, Catholics ask me that before. They say, well... Why do you fear God? Because I, I, anybody who doesn't fear God, I think, is just a fool, frankly. You know. Anyway, why do you fear God if you feel certain that he has accepted you and you are in the kingdom of light and you are you know, made meet to be partaker with the saints in light and everything, and he's not going to send you to hell, basically, no matter what you do, which I, I also like to address this caricatured idea that many uh, uh, Catholics have, that, which unfortunately is true in many cases, of people who profess to be Christians like to believe in eternal security and faith alone and everything because they don't want to live holy lives because they're not really interested in that. They want to have, you know, they look and they say, well, you know, I'm expected to sin because that's what I am, a sinner and everything, and they, they figure that grace covers it all. I, I think that, as, uh, you know, as is written, that a man who has this hope in him purifies himself. I mean, you're really supposed to, like, as you said, work at your salvation with fear and trembling. Not that I fear God is going to send me to hell, but he's, He's fearful anyway. I mean, he can do all kinds of things to you. He's just fearsome, even if you know he's accepted you. I mean, we fear a God who we're also supposed to call Daddy. I mean, there is that dichotomy there. I get very upset when I hear see people wearing shirts that said, Jesus is my homeboy and Jesus is my BFF, best friend forever. And anybody who thinks like that, you know, Jesus is not that kind of friend. You know, there's no other friend you have that says, obey my commands. I mean, he's God. He's he's frightening. Everybody was frightened of him on earth whenever he did his, his uh, manifested his glory. So I do fear God, even though I, I feel he has accepted me, And uh, but that doesn't prevent me from wanting to and endeavoring to live a holy life. You were talking to the other uh, uh, Protestant guy, Jerry, I think his name was, about this issue, and he was saying something, and it sounded like he was saying, oh, well, we sin all the time. And you said, no, not mortally. And I, I would have to agree with that. If I believed in mortal sins, I honestly couldn't remember the last time I committed one because I dread sin. I absolutely avoided it.